Good afternoon. Um, I'd like to welcome you all uh, to the John Hewitt Festival of Literature and Ideas. I know for some of you this will be your first encounter with the John Hewitt Festival of Literature and Ideas, not your first encounter with either literature or, or ideas, I'm sure. Um, but I know also that some of you will have been in the creative writing classes during the week and um, also that some of you will have been part of our discussion with the Arts Council yesterday about what the future is for the arts uh, in Ireland, but the arts generally, because the problems of the current crisis apply everywhere. Some of you will have heard gallery poets yesterday, and uh, or will have heard Donald Ryan in conversation with Michael Hughes, and of course a number of you will be in other discussions on poetry and literature over the next couple of days. Um, but today, I, I, it's kind of a case of explaining uh, those of you who hadn't already encountered us in the annual summer school, which we've been running for 33 years since the death of poet John Hewitt. I should say poet political thinker, pacifist, free thinker, um, dramatist, uh, arts man, arts curator, and so on. And one of the things we've done in that summer school over the years, which means it's not just an arts festival, uh, a book festival, um, but it, it, um, what we've done is tended to bring together poetry and politics or current affairs and contemporary art. And we've never separated the arts from life. Uh, and this year, when we're not having a physical summer school in Armagh, it seemed to us that the Festival of Literature and Ideas was the right terminology for what we're setting out to do. And um, it's that kind of cross-arts, cross-community engagement that John Hewitt uh, pioneered, um, that refusal to separate the poetic from the political, uh, the artistic from the actuality, um, that leads us really to, in this online festival of literature and ideas, um, to our guest today, Misha Glenny, um, whom I guess... I first heard on BBC Radio 4 many years ago, around about the time of uh, Glasnost and Perestroika, when his namesake Misha Gorbachev was uh, changing the face of the world as we know it today. And uh, that was around about the time of the breakup of the USSR and its domination over Central or Eastern Europe uh, and the Eastern Bloc, as we tended to call it. Um, and on through the Balkan Wars and the rise of the number of independent states inside and outside the Russian Federation. Although I have to say the name Misha had always intrigued me. Um, I'd seen the film of the brothers Karamazov when I was 12 in Valley Castle Cinema. And uh, there's a Misha in that. I, I actually took the book out of the library, um, much to the disapproval of the librarian when I was 12. Um, and um, the, the, the Misha in that, there's a lovely line about Misha Rakitin in that novel in which uh, someone says, ah, Misha, he's haunted by a great unsolved doubt. He is one of those who don't want millions, but an answer to their questions. So the mission that we're talking to, to today is someone who uh, has millions of questions. In fact, if, if Misha was writing a Dostoevsky novel, I'm sure it would be crime and punishment, but I don't want to get into trouble with the drugs barons this early in the conversation. So we'll move on from that. And to understand why those millions of questions need asking, I think we probably all know the analogy of Plato's cave in which they, Plato suggested that we were all living in the bottom of this cave and really looking at a, what's virtually a puppet show in the background. The light from the fire is casting uh, images up on the wall and we're fooled into thinking that those images are the real thing. And the relevance of that today, of course, is that those images we're seeing on the wall are what we're getting from mainstream media, fake news, Fox, CNN, uh, right-wing controlled press. However you look at it, someone's still manipulating those images. And uh, in Plato's anal analogy, of course, someone actually goes to the mouth of the cave, looks out at the reality outside, which you would think would be a great revelation and everybody would welcome him back delightedly to say uh, what the news is from outside. But of course, when someone comes back with that kind of information about the fact that we're all being manipulated and only seeing a fraction of the information, uh, it's quite hard to believe them. And the sort of th things that I've discovered from reading Misha Glennie over the years since first hearing of him as a BBC correspondent, a Guardian correspondent in Central and Eastern Europe, things like the fact that organised crime has a bigger GDP than the USA and almost as big a GDP as China with 1.4 billion people. So I'm not sure how many people are involved in organised crime, but they are obviously very highly productive. Uh, and it's that whole idea 
that Misha has gone to the mouth of the cave right up to the, the drugs barons and to the favelas in Rio and uh, places where the police can, or the, uh, a prisoner gang can practically wipe out the police from the outside overnight and the police can do as bad back to them uh, the next night and over the next weeks. He's also the first person that I heard talking seriously about the dark net, which is something that I'd only heard from computer geeks in the basement at work. So, um, uh, but just to go back to that, fascination with the name. I'd always assumed Misha was Russian, uh, although Glennies, most of the Glennies come from round about Aberdeen. So I was quite intrigued by that fact. And it turns out that he's three quarters Anglo-Celtic. This, this from Wikipedia, I have to say. Three quarters Anglo-Celtic and one quarter Jewish. Um, the Anglo-Celtic bit also in, uh, involves people from Dublin and from County Down. And speaking as a Glens of Antrim man, I won't hold that against him, but it does mean that he's come from a very um, British Isles sort of background, British and Ir Irish and Scottish, English, Scottish and Irish background, um, and actually taken on board the whole of that Eastern European experience. I was watching recently, as I'm sure many of you were, the Salisbury poisonings and kept thinking, where had I heard a story like this before? And in fact, the uh, story that I was reminded of was one that's in uh, Misha's book, Mike Mafia, in which someone in Woking is actually, an execution is carried out in Woking by gangsters or, or assassins from one of the failed states about which he'd written so much. And I just wondered what it is about Woking in Surrey and Salisbury and Wiltshire um, <laughs> that are the, the hiding places for these people. So that's a kind of a very broad introduction to Misha Glenny uh, and the kind of questions he's been asking, and the kind of people he's been facing up to and the kind of things he's been revealing. Uh, he's entitled his talk to date, The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. And I think we may all have felt over the past few months we've been in a kind of a, some kind of apocalypse, but um, I think Misha has a lot more to tell us about what the modern day equivalents of uh, death, famine, plague and war are. Well, some of them are still there, but let's, let's hear from Misha. Well, thank you very much, Carl, for that uh, extensive, um, extensive introduction. And I am, in fact, talking to you as a, a freshly minted Irish citizen, ah. thanks to that con connection in County Down, because the Glennies of uh, Newry, who were quite a prominent family until the early 20th century, mercifully, my uh, grandfather, my paternal grandfather, was born in Newry, which... Um, confers on me the right to Irish citizenship, which uh, the minute the Brexit vote happened, uh, I seized at, at this. So I'm now both a British and an Irish uh, citizen and increasingly hugely relieved that I had the privilege to uh, obtain Irish citizenship, even if it was from you know, a community which was essentially a community that arrived in the, uh, in the late 17th century there in Newry. But um, uh, so there you go. So that's that. And uh, just for accuracy's sake, we don't actually know if I'm a quarter Jewish or not. My father claimed that he was half Jewish, and I have tried to uh, uh, ascertain that. But I don't actually have any evidence that that's that that's true. So it remains moot to that point. <laughs> um, but. Uh, uh, but we'll see. I'm sure I'll track it down in the end um, when I have time. So, yeah, so what I wanted to talk about was the four horsemen of the, the modern apocalypse. And there is one horseman who is, is essentially bridges the um, uh, the uh, horseman from the, Rev from the book of Revelations, uh, and that is the pandemic, pestilence, disease, and so on. So we've, we've just experienced that. So I have been concerned for the past 15 years or so that systems uh, that we have created have been running out of control in the world. It's an issue of um, what I refer to as scale, that essentially the mechanisms and networks we are using to uh, manage our our lives across the world have broken the boundaries of what I refer to as human scale. Uh, we can no longer comprehend what is going on, not just uh, in, to, in, in the world in its entirety, but also individual mechanisms such as the climate, such as uh, computer, uh, computer networks, um, 
artificial intelligence, and very soon we're going to have to have quantum computing uh, on top of that, which is going to represent in the next 10 to 15 years a step change uh, in the complexity of the systems that govern our lives. Um, the economy has run out of control in a way that we cannot manage it uh, any more understanding what is what is going on. And uh, m my book, McMaffey, was partly an explanation of why that had happened post-1989. Um, so uh, when the pandemic came along, uh, I tried to identify four areas which are a threat to the species. Um, basically, species destruction is what's at, at stake here. That is the human race. Of course, uh, it's typically uh, um, anthropocentric because um, <laughs> all other species are likely to go as well. There'll probably be a few of the lower level species who, who survive and will um, then bring uh, life back after a period in a sort of enforced hibernation, as it were. Uh, but essentially, if you look at the at the pandemic as the as the starting point, we were woefully unprepared for the pandemic around the world. But that is not because of the fact that we didn't have the knowledge to understand what the impact of a pandemic could be and what we needed to do in order to minimize its impact. It's just that in the ruthless pursuit uh, of power and uh, wealth accumulation, we decided to prioritize other things, chiefly stuffing vast sums of money into the pockets of, uh, of uh, very, few, very few people. Unfortunately, the pandemic also coincided with uh, a very significant break in politics that you can use 2016 as the, the moment where this becomes visible. I would argue that 2008 and the financial crash is the moment where this becomes likely. But I go back, first of all, to 1989 and that great year of revolution when um, half a continent was suddenly liberated from the one-party state and was able to retrieve or build for the first time uh, their democratic rights, and they'd fought very hard for those democratic rights, i.e. a moment of of tremendous optimism. One of the problems about 1989, however, was that it obscured other processes that were going on in the world at the time, primarily um, the uh, economic shift away from uh, 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 Western economies in which the welfare state had uh, tended to dominate towards neoliberalism. Uh, and what that means in concrete terms is the shift of responsibility for people's welfare away from the state and towards the individual, so that the state was no longer assuming as much as of the risk uh, to look after people if they got sick, if they got old and incapable, uh, if they uh, had some form of congenital condition or had become disabled. Um, <clears throat> all that was, or unemployed, uh, all that was shifted away to the individual. So the individual was responsible for dealing uh, for his or her uh, individual fate. And 1989, because it was a tremendous victory for the West, the West had won the Cold War in 1989. And the assumption was that... Uh, Western capitalism and liberal democracy were, as Francis Fukuyama, the American thinker, put it, uh, did represent the end of, of history, and there was nothing else to worry about. And that was then compounded in the 1990s, which I refer to as the decade of delusion, where the initial burst of money um, that was injected into the global economy by the shift to neo neoliberalism, fooled everyone into thinking that we had overcome the cyclical nature of capitalism, 
and we were all going to be uh, very rich and and uh, very very happy. Um, you can see this in uh, both Britain and Ireland. The Celtic Tiger in Ireland was posited on the sudden availability of large amounts of capital, the ability of the Irish government, albeit using um, extremely low tax rates, to attract the behemoths of um, the new digital economy from the United States into Ireland. You can see it in um, Britain with the emergence of huge vanity projects like the Millennium Dome, but also a lot of a, a lot of money injected into the public sector. It all looked fantastic, and it was signed off by Gordon Brown, the then Chancellor of the Exchequer in Britain, referring to this being an economy in which there would be no more boom or bust. Uh, and that was just a few years before one of the most spectacular busts uh, in history. So we were all drinking the Kool-Aid, more or less. One or two people were warning that the amount of debt that was being created was uh, unsustainable. And then, bang, it all goes belly up in 2008. The political impact, just as in 1929, we saw the emergence of Hitler in, uh, in Germany and the consolidation of Mussolini's power in, in Italy, the political impact, as always, was exploited better by the right than it was social democracy or the left. And this culminated um, uh, uh, in the West, in Brexit and, and Trump in 2016. But there were other things going on, developments in Hungary, in Poland, and, and so on and so forth. This was accentuated by the fact that people felt they had lost control. And this comes back to the issue of scale and the fact that we have systems which we can no longer properly manage. And the pandemic is the first manifestation of that. There are, in my opinion, three others, which is why I refer to the three horsemen of the, of the modern apocalypse. apocalypse. Uh, the next one, which I think is the most likely to have a malign impact on us fairly soon, is our increasing dependency, I would say over-dependency, on network technologies, um, <clears throat> uh, soon to be joined by robotics, artificial intelligence, and as I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, quantum computing, machine-to-machine -machine learning is, is uh, another issue. Because what we've seen uh, in the pandemic is, is that uh, without those networked technologies, we would find it very difficult to survive. What we've also seen in the past 10 to 15 years is that these systems are now very, very vulnerable to malfunction and to attack um, from outside forces or indeed from internal forces. So from December the December 2015 onwards, when uh, a group of Russian hackers, um, it's believed supported by the Russian state, brought down part of the electric grid in western Ukraine um, by using a, a virus. Since then, we've seen uh, creeping examples of state-on-state -state attacks against the critical national infrastructures of, of uh, of our country. And because everything now is, um, uh, everything that we do is uh, governed and managed and regulated by network computer systems, whether it's our water supply, whether it's uh, the sewage, uh, our sewage supply, all the utilities, electricity, gas, and so on and so forth, um, uh, uh, plus our financial system, our, our tech, uh, our communication system. When these things go down, we as a society can come to a grinding halt within a week to a week to two weeks. Um, and so uh, that is a, a very very serious problem that we face both individually uh, and as a society. And for me, it is the the second. Uh, horsemen of the modern apocalypse. The third one is weapons of mass destruction. One of the things that we haven't noticed so much since the uh, rise of populism around the around the world is the fact that a lot of the agreements and treaties that we have 
on weapons of mass destruction, particularly nuclear, chemical, and biological, have either lapsed or been actively dismantled um, uh, around the world. So, for example, Trump's uh, claim that his great victory of uh, of uh, was uh, dis was um, trashing the Iran nuclear agreement is uh, complete hogwash uh, because Iran has now restarted developing nuclear weapons. It's made the world a much, much more dangerous place. That's one example, but also treaties between the West and the, and the, the former Soviet Union, now the Russian Federation, uh, have also been brought into question and are, and are being dismantled. So that is a very serious threat, particularly as access to things like chemical weapons, we know from uh, various events around the world, is becoming easier for non-state actors and state actors uh, like uh, Russia's deployment of Novichok in Salisbury, as Cahill mentioned. Um, incidentally, the two writers of uh, the the Salisbury poisonings, uh, Declan Lawn and Adam Patterson, both come from uh, from Northern Ireland, and it, they did an absolutely fantastic right. job on that uh, on that show. It was a really, really excellent show, and I hope very much it's a BAFTA contender next year. But that's a uh, that's a minor point. Um, so uh, uh, you have the weapons of mass destruction, and then you have the fourth. Horseman of the modern apocalypse, which is obviously uh, climate change. And our efforts to combat climate change have been disrupted by the rise of, rise of um, uh, populism uh, in particular. The one good thing uh, about um, the pandemic is, is that the pandemic, the virus is disinterested. It doesn't care um whether uh, uh, whether a leader um sorry that's my 15 minutes that I was going to talk I'll just I'll just Keep finish going. off with this point it doesn't uh, the virus is disinterested it doesn't care whether a leader is funny uh popular um uh whether the uh, whether the leader has believes that it, his or her country has world-beating systems in place, if that leader is presiding over an incompetent administration, it will kill people. And this is why it exposes the uh, fallacious arguments of many of the populists, the people who I refer to as the Iron Men. Uh, I've got a podcast uh, which will be out any minute called The Rise of the Iron Men about uh, uh, people like Johnson, Trump, uh, Bolsonaro, Orban, um, Duterte in the Philippines, Erdogan in Turkey, uh, and Modi in India, is basically if they're incompetent, you get huge levels of in infection rates and deaths with the pandemic. It also demonstrates just how reliant we are on people who do shit jobs for very little money. It also demonstrates just how unequal our societies are. So it's a great exposure of uh, realities, um, COVID. And in that sense, it may be enough to start changing the um, oil tanker of uh, contemporary geopolitics towards a more rational response to issues uh, like the weapons of mass destruction, over-dependency on technology, and, um, uh, and, and climate change. Uh, I, certainly, I certainly hope so. Um, uh, here in the United Kingdom, of course, we have uh, a, a special case because of, of Brexit. What's interesting about Johnston and his administration uh, or should I say Cummings and his administration, uh, is, is that they're doubling down on Brexit as a consequence of COVID it, in a way that defies any kind of rational understanding of what is, what is really going on. So that you know that here in the UK, we are into the territory of an emotional politics that is bound to end in disaster. Within this context, 
it is really, really important that the European Union gets its act together, that Germany and France, Northern and Southern Europe, are able to come up with a rational politics that is not hampered by the exceptionalism of France, Germany, or anyone else, and start to create an alternative pole of politics that could counter the extreme narcissism and dysfunctionality of American politics and the uh, authoritarianism of Chinese uh, Russian uh, politics and, and elsewhere. So we are now at a turning point. We have seen one horseman of the modern ap apocalypse gallop through our ranks, decimating us on the way, and it is by no means over. Will we be able to use this opportunity to turn our political thinking, to turn our, our administrative mechanisms so that we can cope with what is coming, we can reduce inequality, and we can actually head off the prospect of species destruction, which if we carry on as we have been doing in the past 30 years, we are not going to be able to do. Wow. Well, thanks very much for that wonderful um, illustration of these four uh, black black cloaked um, horsemen riding across uh, the devastated kind of uh, Europe and the world. Um, and what what struck me most about how you moved from one to the other was the fact that the four horsemen are in a kind of a relay race or they're all interconnected or perhaps they're all holding hands as they ride across this devastated um, world that we're left with. I, I, it, a number of things came together, particularly in that last piece, because in, in talking about the Iron Men and, and the obvious fact that um, the virus doesn't attack one or other society more or less uh, because it spots a charismatic leader or, or a populist leader or whatever. But in fact, the opposite has been the case, hasn't it? And societies, um, China is very hard to judge in this, but societies like Germany, where people are prepared to work for the mutual good and presumably still have some leftover sense of democracy and community and so on, have done less badly than societies like Britain and America, where people have been encouraged for so long to say, you can do whatever you want now because you're British or because you're American. And they, can't, they not only can't be told to stop, but their leaders believe they can't be told whether it's not to go to the pub or not to go out without a mask. Um, well, something was developed that wasn't there in the 50s and 60s. Not that I saw that much of it myself, but what I understood, we grew up in a, a welfareist and a kind of a communal world, and that was destroyed by Thatcherism and Reaganism, but what has come since is much worse. I, I suppose the question I want to ask is, it, there's somebody else riding along with those horsemen, which is a, a manipulative media controlled by those strong men, a media that, with the exception of investigative journalists like yourself, by and large, seem to almost work as spokespersons for uh, the government. Uh, cer certainly, uh, there's a strong sense that... Um, Downing Street was able to leak things as to whether there will or won't be lockdown and get soundings through journalists who otherwise were people of integrity. But the much bigger thing is that by going ahead with Brexit, they'll be able to say, well, if Brexit failed economically, it's because of COVID. It's nothing to do with us. And I don't think the press are querying that. So is, is the media looking after all four of these horsemen? Well, so there are, there are sort of two fundamental aspects to this question. One, of course, is uh, what's uh, referred to. I, I, I think with a sort of pejorative hint, which you have to be careful about as the mainstream media, and then is there are the social media networks, and I'll, I'll divide those uh, into two. Uh, so here in the United Kingdom, we have had um, a very inegalitarian uh, structure of media ownership for a long time, um, but it was also uh, neutralized to a degree by the by the presence of the the BBC. Um, once Murdoch became convinced that uh, the Euro uh, uh, exiting the European Union would benefit his interests. He's been skeptical about it for a very long time anyhow. Um, 
And once the Barclay brothers uh, took over the telegraph, uh, uh, and given the line of, of the mail, you had the huge beasts of uh, the newspaper world, including the Sun, including, to a degree, the Sunday Times. Murdoch hedged his bet a bit. The Times, he decided, would it, it would for a while become a... Um, become a pro-European newspaper because he wanted to pretend that he was being even-handed. Um, but also, as I say, he was hedging his bets um, in case Brexit didn't happen. But the Sun was uh, very hostile to the European Union. Uh, so was the Mail and so on. So forth. essentially, you had two papers, The Guardian, which was predictable, and The Financial Times, representing primarily business interests, which were uh, pro-EU and didn't buy in to the uh, the populist thing. So you had uh, a big um, majority in terms of the print media in favour of Brexit, which reflected the three owners who were all, of course, you know, ageing white men. Um, uh, who don't, who uh, none of them happen to be resident in the United Kingdom, of course. Um, so uh, that was that was one issue. But then also, as social media started to erode the power of traditional print media, uh, Murdoch decided to up his attempts, and he was supported by the Mail and by the Telegraph in this, to undermine the BBC. Because in particular, they couldn't compete with the BBC's uh, uh, website, because uh, the BBC was able to make that free and, and siphon off part of its, its um, funding from the license fee. And so what we've had over the past 10 years, and Brexit uh, uh, and Cummings uh, has given this a tremendous boost, is an attempt to start dismantling the BBC. We've had a stay of execution because the BBC had what has had so far what's regarded as a good COVID, um, but that's going to come back. We've already seen what's been happening um, in the civil service and in public appointments, whereby political loyalty is valued over competency in the in in these positions. Uh, and now we, I believe, we are going to see the steady erosion, and uh, using salami tactics of the BBC itself, which Britain will be much, much the poorer for, and the populist narrative will dominate. Unless, of course, what starts to happen in the United Kingdom, uh, if we see the same phenomenon that's already started happening in the United States where the incompetence is impacting on so many people who actually voted for Trump in the first place, and that we see from next year that the incompetence combined in terms of responding to COVID and responding to Brexit starts to undermine those very people who voted to Brexit in the first place, and you start to see a shift against the, the Johnson government, then you might see some of the papers uh, uh, jumping ship. But what they want to do, essentially, is before that starts happening, they want to try and trash the BBC. So that's the one thing. There's a battle going on, basically, in Britain's mainstream media for control of the narrative. Now, everything is complicated by another scale issue, which is the scale of social media and the fact that there is uh, no way of controlling what is published on social media and if it's done well, and if it's targeted at people who are particularly vulnerable or gullible, you can get all sorts of nonsense being circulated as supposed truth in a very short space of time. So this is where the issue of uh, Russia, which is very interesting, um, comes into play when it comes to the what, why Russia felt able or necessary to intervene both uh, through social media, both in the uh, U.S. elections, and in the Brexit referendum. So here's what Russia is looking at um, <clears throat> after Putin has consolidated his power in the um, second decade of, of this century. Russia knows that 
They do not have the technological and economic power to compete with China and the United States. The Russian economy is a tenth the size of the American economy. It's half the size of the British economy, you know, uh, battered though the British economy is because of Brexit. It is, the Russian economy is also very dependent on hydrocarbons, um, which are going out of fashion at the moment. And COVID has, uh, has inflicted enormous losses on Russia because of the collapse in uh, the oil price. So Russia looks at its opponents and say, well, we can't keep up with them technologically and in terms of the amount we spend on the, on the military. So how else can we maintain our um, superpower status, which only exists by dint of the fact that we have the residual nuclear arsenal from the Soviet Union? So they look at the West and they say, well, let's look at the West's weaknesses. And the West's weaknesses are the divisions and inequality that emerged because of neoliberalism in, in 2000 and 2008, combined with their democratic systems. So what Russia does is, for very little money, it plays on those weaknesses by accentuating divisions in polarizing countries uh, across the European Union and in the, in the United States. And they use those weaknesses to create a monster like Trump, who they don't actually control, but they love being there because he's so divisive. And with Brexit, they scored big time. It was like, you know, they, they put on a, a, a tenor to back Brexit a couple of years before the, ref, before the referendum. And it comes in at 5,000 to one as far as they're concerned, because what Brexit does is it breaks the link yeah. between the intelligence networks of the United Kingdom, Canada, the United States, Australia, and New Zealand, the so-called Five Eyes, which uh, shares absolutely critical intelligence, not just about security issues, but about the economy as well. It breaks that link with the European Union. And what that does is it makes Germany more dependent on a closer relationship with Russia in terms of its uh, energy supplies. This is the aim of Putin, is to increase German dependency on uh, its, hydro uh, its hydrocarbons and to weaken the European Union and the NATO alliance and the transatlantic alliance in order for it to for it to benefit and because we are too slow as a society at responding to the issues of scale associated with social media with the ability to put out huge amounts of data across large computer networks in a very short space of time we were completely and utterly unprepared for this and we remain very vulnerable. We are only now beginning to discuss issues about Facebook's responsibility, Google's responsibility, Twitter's responsibility for putting out um, unfounded, unsubstantiated crap, which have a profound influence then on how our electorate votes in the polling booths. So, so just picking up on that, because I noticed that one of the one of the horsemen that was missing and, and is probably unnecessary now, war war wasn't one of your four horsemen, because we seem to be doing enough damage with WMD and the plague and so on. That, uh, but I wonder, uh, in, in terms of the Russian influence, uh, the pretty clear Russian influence in American politics, and the suspected Russian influence, and I can only say that because we haven't seen the report yet, uh, but Russian influence in, in British politics. Good luck with that now yeah. that uh, Grayling has been appointed chair of the committee. That is, a, I mean, it's just, you know, this, this government, I just have to say this, this government is going beyond anything that previous governments have done in terms of breaking the rules and the, and the norms of, uh, of institutional uh, checks and balances. We've, uh, you know, we're no longer in Kansas, basically. But, but that's right. And, and one, one of the interesting things, of course, was when you mentioned Francis Fukuyama and the idea of the end of history and the triumph of liberal democracy. But what we seem to have created in Russia was a, a kind of a Frankenstein monster made up of... of the, the dead body of communism, if you like, the dead body of a totalitarian society, which has turned into a monster. The question is whether we can control the monster or whether it's controlling us. And I think you've hinted at both possibilities there um, in terms of the influence, the apparent influence in America. But obviously what's dominating that, I think, is that business 
uh, and particularly people like Trump who have international business, seem to be dominating world politics more than either ethics or social systems or capitalist systems. I mean, it's capitalism, of course, but that people's individual links with Russia out of which they're making money mean that do we keep it at close quarters or is it keeping us at close quarters? <laughs> Well, it's a it's a very uh, complicated subject. One that I'm actually I'm actually looking at at the moment because I'm trying to understand why it was that um, British business, which was overwhelmingly um, pro EU and overwhelmingly remain, uh, failed to assert its interests, uh, and what that suggests to me. And you've hinted at some of the reasons for it. Is is that there are uh, global corporate interests or interests from other states, which have sufficient money and influence to uh, override that. Uh, the funding of individual conservative politicians from Russian and Ukrainian money is gobsmacking, and I really look forward to seeing the unredacted version of the intelligence re report on that. But there's a whole load of other things. There's the influence of, um, of Saudi money, um, of, of Qatari money, uh, and so on and so forth. London essentially became, during the 1990s, became the largest international hub for parking money and for laundering, for laundering money. Um, and I know full well that the uh, serious organized crime agency in, in London, the um, predecessor to the National Crime Agency, was told not, this is under the Blair administration, was told not to investigate Russian money too closely because the city was making huge sums out of this and it was all part of the mystique of... of Cool Britannia of everyone wanting to to uh, come and uh, come and live here. We're now beginning to see, and we, you know, the the work that I've done, but more recently, people like um, Nick Shackson and Oliver Bullo and various other people in a, in America. An absolutely seminal book is Dark Money by Jane Mayer, the New Yorker uh, correspondent. We're now beginning to see just how corrupted these systems uh, became over the past 20 to 30 years. But I, I, I'm, I'm ambiguous about saying whether we can do anything about it because uh, we, write the, we write the future and it's, it's up to us. The, the, the call to political action, to action towards fundamental uh, reform to try and uh, halt this drive towards uh, towards ever greater inequality, ever greater political uh, corruption, um, is now urgent. But because of her COVID, it can be heard more loudly. What you need to do is to find some form of political vehicle that will bring to, together all reasonable people across the ideological spectrum, because there are people both on the left and the right who are appalled by the prospect of climate change, appalled by the prospect of, of, uh, of uh, rising levels of inequality, uh, to somehow reinsert this sentiment that we must start behaving more rationally um, into the political discourse uh, and into uh, 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 into some form of sort of electoral response to what's going on. We cannot expect it from Xi Jinping or from Vladimir Putin. Uh, uh, Xi Jinping has already made himself president for life. Putin's just effectively done that with his constitutional with his constitutional changes. Uh, uh, Putin has been in power for far too long to expect him to do anything other than become tougher and tougher because he's gone through that psychological stage where nobody will dare uh, criticize him. Xi Jinping likewise is, is, as I say, heading in that direction. And so it is up to the you know, remaining 
uh, the remainder of us in the democratic world to do something about this. Otherwise, we are otherwise we are going to be lost. So I do believe that COVID is a call to political action. But now that COVID has exposed the levels of incompetence in the populist countries, and it's it's not just. Um, Britain and the United States, it's uh, Bolsonaro's Brazil. I mean, you know, the populists are almost all up there in the top rates of infections and death. And of course, it has escaped no one. Well, actually, it's probably escaped half of the world, but it should not <laughs> escape anyone. That those countries which have done the best, Taiwan, New Zealand, Finland, Denmark, Germany, they are all led by women. And in the case of Taiwan, the vice president is an epidemiologist. Uh, and they all understand what is what about how you deal with a pandemic, because they are uh, primarily, I think, they're women who seek to protect rather than seek to, um, you know, expand their vanity in the way that Trump and Johnson uh, attempt to do on a, on a daily level, which is frankly revolting. Or, or keep shoveling money to their male chums, but that's another yeah, story. Yeah, that's so, another. so I mean, I'm just uh, intrigued by that idea that, that there is a sense there in what you're saying that with that somehow we can get back to democracy. I mean, those years you talk about between 19, well, between 2000 and 2008, I went to several of the Leonard Cohen sort of, uh, you know, comeback concerts in which the big point at which everybody stood up and cheered was democracy is coming to the USA. Um, I think democracy has been and gone, just as Leonard Cohen has been and gone. But he also said, sign, you know, first we take Manhattan, then we take Berlin. Then we take Seems Berlin. Me, Berlin is on our side. <laughs> Berlin is on the, on the side of the angels, and Manhattan is kind of, well, maybe Manhattan isn't, but, but America is kind of lost to democracy. But do you have a real sense, and this is kind of the world going way back to John Hewitt and CND protests, which seem very mild things in, in the English Midlands or in Belfast in the 70s, um, uh, trying to stop nuclear war and so on. It seems to me that uh, although you talked about weapons of mass destruction, war isn't the real problem. It's how we get on the rest of the time, unless you're also envisaging that there's a conflagration around the corner. Well, you know, when you are see... We, are we in the conflagration without war? Uh, where, you know, I, I, I mean, Donald Trump is an unstable narcissist. Yeah. And, you know, he carries around the red button wherever he, wherever he goes. And uh, one of the things that really struck me about the first two years or so of the Trump administration was that the um, much vaunted institutions of democratic control in the United States uh, actually buckled pretty quickly uh, under a narcissist uh, like Trump. Similarly, in, in the United Kingdom, uh, you know, this is, it's, it's quite extraordinary that this obsession of English exceptionalism is uh, driving the breakup of the the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. And I always think it's ironic that this is the Conservative and Unionist Party that is doing it. You know, it's just amazing to see an ERG stalwart like Marc Francois <laughs> write to Michel Barnier complaining about the prospect of a customs barrier across the Irish Sea, when this is something that his prime minister had signed and which for Mark Francois had voted for, uh, but four months, four months earlier. They're utterly delusional. And what well, this is—I <laughs> mean, the delusionality is, is amazing, isn't it? The, the it's people... just incredible, you know. I mean, and we can see this during COVID. The fact is, is that. Um, uh, is that Nicola Sturgeon, uh, you know, is is prepared to, for the first time, put what is effectively a border between Scotland and, and England because she doesn't trust the English government or the government in Westminster uh, to um, to manage the the pandemic properly. So we're we're seeing that we're seeing that break up, and they don't they don't seem to care. They don't even seem to. Notice it. I, you know, uh, the world is turned upside down. But back to the original point about uh, about war is is that there is a real danger that the caprice of these people will lead to some sort of issue. 
can't be excluded initially that you know that something could happen in the Pacific over Chinese and U.S. Uh, U.S. dynamics in the South China Sea. We know that the Chinese American relationship is going to be the main point of conflict over the next uh, fifteen to twenty years, whether Trump stays in in power or or not. Um, so that. Uh, that is an issue there, but also you've had proliferation of nuclear and chemical weapons all over the place. So Pakistan and India shape up now and then with growling threats over Kashmir. We've seen India and China shape up with growling threats over the northern Indian border. Then, of course, we have the fact that Iran is now developing nuclear weapons. Israel already has them. So does Saudi, Ar so does Saudi Arabia. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, it's, uh, you're seeing the, the same thing in the development of, of, of chemical and biological weapons. They're much easier to manufacture now. So just as you have, what, just as in cyber, in cyber there, is no, um, there are no rules of the road. There is no regulatory system for cyber. And so uh, because cyber is a preemptive weapon, you have to know what's going on in your opponent's network systems. It means that everyone is hacking everyone else's system. Anything can go wrong. There is a, a, there's a real sense that uh, the mechanisms of control, hideous though they were during the, the Cold War, they are being rapidly loosened, and so we don't have a sort of hotline system to bring us back from the the brink should the um, should there be a political deterioration which leads to the possibility of usage of, of weapons of mass destruction having said that i mean i agree with you in principle i agree that it's it's uh, societal problems and economic problems and technological problems that uh, not to mention climate change which are probably yeah. the greatest threat i only mention weapons of mass destruction because um, because those bonds of control have been loosened. And you shouldn't imagine that suddenly we no longer face a nuclear threat or we no longer face uh, a, threat of, uh, a threat of chemical or biological warfare, because we do. So in, in terms of um, this idea that, that really people might see through to some kind of truth, despite all the noise that's cutting across us through social media and through a manipulated press and, and so on. Um, th that problem, to some extent, I would still have some faith that the arts, the arts can in some way keep interrogating that. And it was always the idea of people like John Hewitt through the 60s and 70s, through the, from the 30s to the 60s and 70s, that the arts had a role in looking at how we live. I think one of the things that the arts often did, and certainly novelists, playwrights, uh, poets often did, was envisage a kind of dystopian world in which, let's say, everybody was under house arrest for four months or the streets of European cities were completely deserted or uh, 65,000 people died in three months in Britain uh, and that would have been dystopia and yet we're kind of living in the middle of dystopia. I can see the sun is shining outside this evening and um, hot, what, what can our, and the whole point about writing about dystopias was to say if we're not careful uh, you know, right, right back to it. it could happen here. If we're not careful, we'll end up in this situation. We have ended up in this situation. How can we talk or write or, or get people to think their ways out of it? I, I agree, investigative journalism is a major part of that. Um, what can the, the arts do if dystopia is on our doorstep? Well, uh, I'll be honest here. I'm slightly, I'm slightly party pre, and I go from a, a, a sort of top-down position on this. So, uh, McMafia, my book on the globalization of organized crime and the increasingly um, entangled relationship between organized crime and political corruption, came out in uh, 2008. Got very nice reviews all over the place, and. Uh, it sold about uh, 200,000 copies around the world. It was translated into a lot of languages. Uh, you know, in publishing terms, it was seen as a, a big success. Um, uh, law enforcement officers liked it. Criminals liked it. Sociologists liked it. Um, general readers liked it. It was great, you know, but it didn't change the world. Um, 
10 years later, it took 10 years before this was made into a fictional TV drama series um, written, written by an ex- ex- extremely talented uh, Oscar-nominated screenwriter, Ho- Hossamini, and directed by another distinguished um, uh, film man, James Watkins. When McMafia came out, and it's been broadcast all over the world, the impact was very significant. So within, it actually coincided with the Skripal poisonings in Salisbury, which also had an impact. But I had been part of an informal coalition working for 10 years to try and get various changes to our laws in Britain, primarily the establishment of um, transparent registries of companies in Britain and in the overseas territories uh, so that one would know who the beneficial ownership of a company was that was investing heavily in property or in business uh, in the United Kingdom. And successive governments uh, balked against this, didn't want to do it. And it was a big struggle to get it through. Uh, When Theresa May came in, she tried to slow it down again. Cameron actually had worked quite hard to move this forward. But Theresa May tried to slow it down. And McMafia, the TV series, came out just at the right time. Uh, and it alerted people to the extent of infiltration of foreign money into the British economy. And McMafia was one of the factors, by no means the only one, that helped tip some of this legislation uh, over the uh, uh, across the line in Parliament, including one piece of legislation which is now known as the McMafia Law, um, which is the um, unexplained wealth orders, where people have huge amounts of money and they can't uh, prove why when they're buying property and so on in in London. So, for me, as the author of a book which did tolerably well, but everyone else had forgotten, uh, to have that book now enshrined as the title of, of, of a piece of legislation, McMafia, the McMafia Law, is absolutely fantastic. But the point is this, is, is that that moderately successful book starts to have a huge impact. McMafia is now a byword for dirty money. And you can look it up on, on Twitter and things like that. Everyone uses McMafia as a, as a shorthand. I am fairly convinced that the way you start to shift public opinion is, or or one of the most effective ways, is through television drama, which is the, uh, uh, I I do believe it is the novel of the 21st century, the early 21st century, and the way that the novel moved people in in the 19th century. Now, in order to produce successful television dramas, you need a huge hinterland of writers, of actors, of creative talent in art, in design, um, uh, in talent management, in, in every area before you get to that summit of a television drama which really impacts things politically. And so I don't see television drama as being discreet from the rest of the creative industries and the artistic impulses uh, here, for example, in the in the United Kingdom, but also, as we know, uh, Irish and, and British arts have, have always been intertwined for reasons which I don't have to, to, to go into. Um, so for me, the arts, apart from the fact that they make a huge amount of money, and we earn much more money disproportionately in Britain and Ireland from the arts than a lot of other countries do because of the fact that we have uh, English as a, first, as a first language, and we have these great traditions as well. Um, <clears throat> if without, without the arts... Um, we are going to be severely diminished, not just economically, not just spiritually and morally, but politically uh, as well. And that is why COVID is is truly, truly damaging for this uh, um, for this uh, sector. 
And uh, of course, you're unlikely to get in the United Kingdom, you're unlikely to get a an artistic community that is in sympathy with a government which is closing borders down all all over the place whether you're looking at music and the ability of musicians uh, to travel with their instruments into the European Union or from the European Union uh, uh, to to hear whether you're looking at people in the video games industry which is an absolutely massive industry and dependent on our creative talents my son happens to be a video games designer. He's 30 years old, and he works here in the United Kingdom, but he's been very keen. He speaks other languages. He's been very keen to go abroad and work there. He now discovers that at the top of every job application to work in the games industry in Sweden, France, uh, Germany, Spain, wherever it is, the first line is... Um, open to EU citizens yes. only. Yes. And although I've got my um, Irish Thank citizenship, you. unfortunately, I'm not permitted um, to uh, give it to my, to my sons, although it's something I'd really like to explore. But their possibility for creative exchange and for work and everything has been ripped from them. And it's been ripped from the creative industries in the United Kingdom as, as well. So this is an essential issue uh, from from all perspectives, as far as I'm concerned. Great. I mean, that was a, a great sort, sort of summary for, for the defense of the arts, but also a, a, a reminder of how much damage both Brexit and COVID are doing to uh, the arts and the arts and literature in the service of ideas and the arts and literature in the service of um, a, a better world, a decent world, uh, a world in which we have some say and a world in which we aren't controlled and manipulated and a world in which those four cloaked horsemen aren't riding across a vastly deserted terrain. It's been a, a, a revealing, a revelation. It's a, a, are those four horsemen in the book of revelations? They must be, but it's been a book of revelations. Yeah, 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 okay. It's been, a, it's been apocalyptic, but it's been a book of revelations, uh, Misha, and uh, I've certainly got, taken away a lot to think about. I'm sure everybody who's joined us today is taking away an awful lot to think about and discuss. I was going to say discuss in the pub, but as to whether the pubs will be open next week under the next <laughs> burst of lockdown, I don't quite know. But these are ideas, uh, and it's just wonderful to talk to somebody who is at the forefront of keeping those ideas alive and uh, in relation to society and in relation to the arts, which I think is, is what we're trying to do here with the John Hewitt Festival. Uh, it, uh, I think it's been astonishing. Thanks very much for your time and for the brilliance and fluency of your ideas. Thanks very much, Mission. Cal, you're most uh, you're most welcome, and I'm I'm very pleased to be speaking at the virtual uh, uh, summer school. I, I you know I only wish I were doing it in Armagh because I've discovered County Down quite well quite a lot over the past couple of years or so. Uh, I haven't yet got to know Armagh, and I would very much like to. So uh, I hope I'll be able to come back sometime when this is no longer virtual. When, you certainly will when we reach the new normal, if anybody can remember what the new normal was supposed to look like. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Mission. You're welcome. Yeah.